Great. Right? Mayur, please take this Thank forward. Thank you. Right. All right. So, um, you know, why are we here, right? Uh, I call this uh, period the AI spring. And in fact, uh, you know, uh, the, the wonderful faculty that is there at ISCN, who's, who's uh, much more senior to me, can give you a much better historical perspective, right? But uh, the, 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 the thing is, this is not something new, right? AI has been around for a while. It has been around since 1950s. It had different names, starting with statistics, machine learning, uh, and so on and so forth, right? And, and the, the thing is, it has gone through two AI winters as well, which means there have been periods when there was a lot of hype, there was a lot of interest, and uh, you know, the, somehow the interest was lost. Right? Nobody cared about it for a while. Um, so this is not new, right? Um, but obviously, today we are living in a, uh, in, a, in a frenzied environment when it comes to AI ML, right? As you can see, the number of papers that are published in machine learning on archive are outpacing Moore's law, which means the, the rate at which we can pack transistors uh, uh, on, on the chip is, is shorter than the number of papers that we are publishing, right? Uh, then tickets to NIPs are selling out in 12 minutes, faster than a rock concert, right? Data scientists are the sexiest job in the 21st century. So you've seen all of this, right? Um, why are we here, right? So I, the way I see it, uh, you know, there were uh, a lot of, uh, these are the three important stars that had to align for this AI spring. Uh, and, and I must say that what is different about this AI spring is that it has lasted for a while. It's been more than a decade and, and, and still going strong the way I see it, right? So three things happened, right? One is growth of data. All these uh, consumer internet companies like the Google, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, started collecting lots and lots of data about uh, the, uh, their products and their users. And what made it easy, obviously, was the uh, increase of compute uh, hardware storage, right? And, and, and now even custom hardware. What I mean by custom hardware is these days you have uh, GPUs, TPUs, FPGA, et cetera, right? Uh, very specialized hardware to, to um, uh, go through this data and, and, and uh, you know, uh, basically look at your tensors and then multiply them or whatever the case may be, right? And the last, but one of the most important pieces is the commoditization of AI and machine learning blocks, which means if these big companies had decided that, you know what, the, the software or the library to do deep learning or to do something else is proprietary and they would not have open sourced it, including the platforms, we would not be here. But in, in the spirit of the open source uh, community uh, uh, framework, a lot of uh, these frameworks are today open source, whether it is TensorFlow, Keras, uh, even, even data is becoming open source, right? A lot of these models are now getting open source. And so when you put all of these three things together, um, anybody, you know, any, any person sitting out of their home can today, you know, fire up a compute job on one of these public clouds use one of these uh, data models and then you know build on top of it and, and build something that is really powerful, right? And I think that has uh, really uh, created this uh, interest in all of us looking at various problems, trying to come up with new algorithms or tweaking exist existing algorithms and so on and so forth, right? So it is certainly a golden age to be in this, uh, in, in AI, machine learning and so on. And, and uh, I think, you know, I would be, uh, doing a disservice if I didn't mention deep learning, right? Obviously, I think uh, one of the uh, recent uh, hot techniques is basically deep learning, right? And, and the quick historical perspective on that is uh, ImageNet, right? It, this, there was this uh, large-scale image uh, uh, visual recognition challenge that ImageNet created. And uh, in 2010 is when ImageNet uh, uh, first, uh, uh, sorry, in, in 2012, uh, the, the challenge has been around, but in 2012, we had a breakthrough when AlexNet created this uh, uh, convolutional network with a lot of layers and so on, and it was able to achieve a big jump uh, or reduction in the error rate, right? And, and since then, obviously, there have been a lot of entries by Google, Microsoft, and so on and so forth. The, the networks have become larger, and, and now, in fact, these uh, networks do better than human, right? So this dotted line is a human error, and, uh, you know, this sparked a lot of interest. Now, this magic that happened in image recognition was later on uh, kind of uh, repeated in speech recognition as well. So something hap similar happened there. And today, the systems that you see actually beat humans in terms of transcribing uh, or, or audio, uh, uh, audio snippets, right? And, and finally, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, the same thing has happened with NLP. 
which means the machine's ability to comprehend a uh, text and maybe answer questions about it or or complete a sentence etc is uh, at its peak today right i mean we have not seen this kind of a thing what what i'm showing here on the screen here is somebody types in what is there in the blue and then the machine then completes the rest of it now forget the factual correct uh, 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 correctness of this right what is being typed there may or may not be true but if you look at the uh, the language model it is as good as a human if not better right so i think that is the part that i'm trying to showcase there right and and this is was achieved through gpt2 which i think many of you know is one of the biggest like uh, neural networks with 1.5 billion weights and so on and so forth right so obviously deep learning is is a big elephant in the room i mean and i mean, mean it in a nice way right i mean i'm not saying that it's it's a bad thing but uh, and 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 one of the big reasons for so much interest but let me take a pause there right i, I you know talk about being a good data scientist uh, uh, you are if you just know deep learning trust me you will not be a good data scientist the reality is that uh, in industry even though now a lot of problems are being solved using deep learning bulk of the problems a bulk of the problems which have structured data are still being solved using other techniques so please don't give a a, a step daughterly or step son treatment to all of the the classic data science techniques that are out there you know right from your regressions to decision trees to uh, support vector machines to logistic regression and what not right these are very much still the workhorse of the industry and are being used a lot even today and and in fact if i were to put a dollar value on on uh, uh, you know which technique brings us most of the revenue or or uh, earnings these classic techniques will uh, uh, beat deep learning uh, by a large margin i mean some of the biggest uh, success stories in a uh, uh, consumer internet like advertising etc to a large extent runs on classic techniques like logistic regression and so on right so few takeaways a large number of uh, techniques neural and non neural exist in the ai literature identifying what is the right technique for the right problem is really important and that will is one of the ingredients that makes you a good data scientist but how do you get there uh, the the way to figure out what is the right technique for a right problem comes from how well you understand that particular algorithm understanding the pros and cons you know understanding the running run time of these techniques right uh, and uh, that is what will differentiate you see this particular aspect is very important implementations have been commoditized but not understanding there are dime a dozen libraries that will do deep learning for you but what is happening under the hood what is back propagation you know uh, what are the weights that are being optimized how are they being optimized what is stochastic gradient descent what is it good for what is it not good for how much running time does it take this is something that you will have to learn the hard way you know there there is no uh, easy way to download it into your brain right so it's important to understand get a good breadth and a uh, selective depth what i mean is don't start with uh, imagenet right don't start with convolutional neural networks uh you know that is something that you should use once you have a good breadth of the area that's a good area to uh, to pick and go deep into it so for somebody else it might be speech for somebody else it might be completely different like a time series forecasting right but don't start there right similarly uh, and and of course this doesn't apply to you you're already taken the first step in joining a great institute and and taking one of the good courses there but you know don't fall for uh courses which promise you that you will become a data scientist in one day right it's not going to happen like how interesting uh, is that tournament right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to quickly rush through uh you know one give you an appreciation for is this all just research and papers no it is not this is being very much used in industry and i'm going to take uh, maybe next 5 10 minutes to uh borrow examples from e-commerce right See, this is the only place where i'm going to be a little partial towards flipkart and and talk about problems we solve in flipkart but the rest of the talk was meant to be more industry wide talk so to say right nothing about e-commerce nothing about flipkart so but i think this will be a good way to teach you how these uh, techniques are actually being used in industry so i think a lot of you know about flipkart we have 250 million users uh, or 200000 sellers 100 million products we are a marketplace right we are a e-commerce marketplace our app has been downloaded many 100 million Uh, times over 
and we reach almost 100% of the PIN codes in India, right? And, and needless to say, we collect lots and lots of data and, and process it every day, right? So that's who we are, an and, um, e-commerce marketplace with a huge footprint and a huge uh, customer base. These are some of the areas where we use data science. And, you know, uh, from fraud detection to merchandising and advertising to, to our supply chain or logistics, to uh, the classic ways in which you know e-commerce, which is recommendation algorithms, search algorithms, to uh, making our app more friendly and accessible to the next 200 million users. What it translates to is, uh, you know, new interfaces for our customers, which are voice-based, which are vernacular in nature, and so on and so forth, right? In all of these areas, data science is being used in a very real way with very real impact. Let's look at some examples. Review translation, right? A lot of our reviews are in English. Today, many of our new users are speak only Hindi. What this graph tells you is that in uh, in 2021, the number of uh, Indian language speakers, not English speaking, right? Only Indian language speaking people who will be online is, is going to be much more than English speaking. And if these guys need to understand our app, right? I need, uh, they need to understand all of its content in their language. So our app is today in 10 regional languages, including Hindi. And all of the content that is there on our app needs to be translated. Now you'll say, isn't translation a solved problem? All of the big companies, Microsoft, Google, et cetera, have a translation engine. So why not just use that? Now, forgetting the uh, uh, you know commercial aspects of it, right? Let's put that aside. The point I want to make is that those translation systems don't always work for us. And I'm giving you some examples, right? The kind of content that I want to translate is uh, uh, very colloquial. It has a lot of spelling mistakes. It is, uses a lot of slang. It uses a lot of emojis, which are not shown in the examples here, right? How do I translate such a content? And we have tried to translate it using, you know, some of these leading e uh, sorry, leading uh, uh, solutions out there. And you can see that it does a pretty poor job. What I'm showing there is also our in-house solution that we have built in collaboration with IIT Patna as one of the academic collaborations that we did. And you can see in these examples that it does a far better job. So the point is for the kind of uh, language uh, uh, that we deal with or the language models that we deal with, uh, a translation doesn't work and we need to solve it uh, in-house. And, and of course, then we need to look at a lot of challenges with respect to parallel corpora, uh, dealing with the spelling mistakes and so on and so forth. So these are some of the research problems, right? Let's look at uh, computer vision, right? Um, we are a marketplace. Our sellers will give us uh, upload information about our uh, about their products, right? Now, when a, when an image like this is uploaded to Flipkart, the first thing that we need to do is make sure that it is safe for our platform, that it does not contain any offensive content. It is safe to show to our customers. It does not violate any uh, policies uh, by the Indian government or otherwise, right? You know, it should not have bad words. It should not have uh, uh, images related to some drugs and so on and so forth, right? So there are, there are such policies as well. Additionally, going beyond moderation, we need to make sure that how can we extract information out of it? So figuring out where are the products being shown? So object detection. What is uh, extracting attributes about the products, right? The color of the garment. Is it a full sleeve versus a, a half sleeve? What type of, of a neck does it have? Does it have a, a round neck? Does it have a V neck? And so on and so forth, right? Uh, what type of a clothing is it? Is it is it a uh, uh, is it a salwar? Is it a jacket? Uh, and, and so on and so forth, right? So there are many such attributes that we automatically extract uh, using computer vision. Um, this is uh, uh, again an uh, uh, example of a classic. A technique like logistic regression, but logistic regression at a very high scale. So every day on our platform, there are billions of content that we show to our users. Uh, what I mean by content is an advertisement or a product card or a recommendation, right? Predicting whether the user will engage with that content, which means predicting the click through rate, estimating the probability that the user will click on that piece of content. Or after clicking that content, will the user ultimately buy that piece of uh, uh, a product that was shown, right? Or will it lead to a conversion? We need to build such models at scale, right? These are online models, um, and and we use a lot of uh, techniques like uh, follow the regularized leader, which is an online algorithm for logistic regression, right? 
and these models are then being used across multiple of our uh, uh, products, whether it is video ads, whether it is banner ads, homepage widgets, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, I would like to point out that as an example of the scale, right? Uh, we have a in-house uh, Go-based uh, algorithm here, or implementation rather, right? The algorithm is not really our own. It is an, uh, it's a well-known algorithm in the literature where on a single uh, 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 CPU core, we are able to handle uh, uh, almost billions of data points in a day. So that's the scale at which we are operating. So the scale is one of the challenges here and, and online learning, of course, right? Let's look at FinTech. So this is again a classic example of a predictive uh, 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 analysis, right? Whether somebody, uh, if I give a loan to you, like a buy now, pay later, is basically a form of a loan, right? Where we allow you to buy certain products uh, without paying. And at the end of the month, we send you a bill saying that, okay, hey, look, you, you bought products from Flipkart worth uh, 3,500 rupees. Now, uh, please uh, transfer this money into the account, right? So it's a kind of a credit or a loan, right? Estimating whether this user has the uh, 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 capacity to repay that loan, right? Whether he will have the intent to repay the loan using his uh, past uh, data on Flipkart uh, is, is basically what we are trying to do here, right? Similarly, uh, uh, trying to predict, uh, if you are trying to come up with an insurance product, right? Uh, like uh, an example of an insurance product that we have is a complete mobile protection. So we, for a few rupees or something, a few hundred rupees, we will allow you to insure any damages to your phone, right? So how can we predict the probability that damage will happen? What is the right kind of uh, uh, premium to charge you for a complete mobile protection are some of the problems that we are trying to solve in this area. So anyway, so those are some of the problem areas, right? Now, if you look at the trends, right? Earlier, there was a trend in industry. Everybody was building their own uh, algorithm or a model, right? So everything was a full vertical, which means, you know, if you were a data scientist, you said, okay, I need to do a uh, build a model for uh, uh, image moderation. Somebody else needs to build a model for uh, uh, attribute extraction and they independently build their model. Today, particularly in natural language processing and computer vision, uh, the, the recent trend is to actually build these platforms, which means to, to build modular parts of libraries which share data, which share uh, libraries, and which can be then put together like a Lego to, to build the final solution. So the bottom layer is your data, right? All the data that you've collected for NLP, for computer vision. Then on top of that, you build some basic libraries. Then these are then combined to, to build a particular model, which are then exposed using some products to the uh, uh, user. So that's one of the recent trends, which is platformization in NLP and computer vision uh, that is happening. Uh, one of the other recent trends that I mentioned earlier is the, the latest frontier in uh, deep learning is uh, natural language processing, where, uh, you, you know, uh, the industry is building these mammoth uh, uh, language models. The GPT-3, for example, has 175 billion weights, right, which are trained using pretty much all the text that is out there. Um, now, of course, a lot of this is being built for English. The challenge is to do something similar for Indian languages where the, the data in these Indic languages is very sparse, right? So how do you build these uh, 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 models or language models for Indian languages is a challenge. But this is some of the re recent work that is happening. Additionally, you know, there are very innovative uh, applications of machine learning. Like, you know, one of the problems is what packaging do I use, right? Should I use a plastic packaging? Should I use a cardboard? And, and even this is being decided using models, right? Uh, predicting the quality of e-commerce products is is uh, uh, are some of the examples of very innovative uh, problems, and there are many more actually that are being solved. One other thing that I want to talk about, which is very very important, is um, you know what I call as fair uh, you know responsible AI. What is responsible AI? Right? There are three aspects to it. One is to make AI that is ethical, um, uh, it, it, make sure that it is privacy preserving and make sure that it is transparent, transparent to the customers as well as transparent to business. So the ethical aspects is, you know, not having biases in your data, right? Uh, you know, if, when I search for uh, some images, you know, there are some inherent biases where all the model uh, images of models might be white skin Caucasian, right? You don't want to just show them because it, it sends a wrong signal, right? So how do you make sure that you include 
other races, other all genders and so on and so forth, uh, when you show uh, image results and so on and so forth. Right? So those are some of the problems related to fairness or, or, or uh, being ethical. Then uh, whenever you build these machine learning models, you don't want them to be black boxes because you're answerable to your customers. See, you're taking very important decisions for them today, right? You are deciding if somebody gets a visa or not. You might be deciding if somebody gets a loan or not. And that loan, it could be a student loan, it could be a loan for uh, a, a medical procedure or whatever the case may be, right? Something very important to the customer. If you're rejecting that loan to them, you, you owe them an answer why that loan was rejected, right? And not just to your customer, but also to your uh, business counterparts, right? If your internal business stakeholders are relying on you to build a correct model, it's not just important that your accuracy and precision are, are good numbers, right? Even those edge cases where you might be making the wrong decisions might be very important to them, which is why telling uh, them why that decision was taken, which feature led to that particular decision, right? Uh, or that tra transparency is uh, being able to debug the model uh, is, is really important. So those are some of the uh, uh, recent trends in AI and, and, and there are a lot of papers, there are a lot of, um, uh, you know, tutorials on this topic as well, right? Now, uh, before I get into my uh, tips for being a good data scientist, and I'll, I'll get to that very quickly, I'll talk about a few uh, uh, important things that are happening, right? See, until now, AI was largely a good to have. Everybody was excited about it. Everybody from the CEO to board was talking about it, right? It was a, it was like a, it was a toy to them, right? You know, let's try it out. Everybody's talking about it, but that is no more the case, right? Everybody is now expecting the real business results from this technology, right? There are a lot of open source uh, implementations, right? Uh, development cycles have been shortened, but at the same time, you know, it, it life has become harder for data scientists because now you need to know which is the right libraries I should pick to put together my solution. And I have to do it in such a way that it is sustainable, it is scalable, it is uh, extendable also, right? It's not just about building the model today. Tomorrow when new requirements come or new data comes, it should be easy, right? So there are so many libraries. Which one is the right one to pick? How should I build the platform? It requires you to have that understanding of architecture, scalability, and so on and so forth. And I'll come to these points and I'll, I'll make it more explicit as well, right? And, and production deployment is increasing. So in between 2018 and 19, the number of organizations that deployed AI into their products grew from 4% to 14%. And it has only grown since then, right? Come 2020, 2021, that number has grown. Uh, success in AI is basically about rapid prototyping, putting something into production, experimenting on top of it, looking at your error case scenario, and going back to the going back to the whiteboard, doing new feature engineering, and so on and so forth, right? And how do you bring bring structure to this, right? Meaning, not just do it in a haphazard way. Every team is doing something different. But can you build agile technologies around it, right? Can you, uh, 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 you know, these frameworks in software development like continuous integration, continuous deployment? How can you bring similar things to AI ML software? Is basically what uh, 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 success means these days. Anyone who can do that right, anybody who can uh, have a faster production cycle, anyone who can deploy their soft AI software faster, who can do continuous integration, continuous deployment uh, with the right testing and so on, is the winner today in industry. So we internally have come up with uh, a software development life cycle. We have defined what are the milestones. We have said, what is the responsibility of the data scientist? What is the responsibility of the engineer? What is the responsibility of the product manager, right? And, and these are important. Uh, I think uh, it might be hard for you sitting in a university to have an appreciation for this, right? But without these kinds of milestones, deliverables, artifacts, it becomes very hard to take something into production to make something robust. And, and I think one needs to develop an appreciation for software development uh, uh, to, to do that, right? So that's a message I wanted to give across. So I, I don't know, I think the last two, three slides might have been a little confusing for some of you because you know, you're still not in industry or at least some of you have not been in industry, right? Maybe some of you have been, uh, but uh, let me get right into 
my uh, tips for you right so these are uh, uh, you, you know uh, 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 tips that will hopefully help you and uh, these are my personal views so let's see what those are right uh, get under the hood that's point number 1 right it, it, be the person who builds the car not just the driver right today there will be many people uh, there are high school students and i kid you not right i'm not exaggerating i know many high school students in india in us who can uh, build a, a deep learning model right because it's made like i said all the things that i talked about earlier right this commoditization of libraries uh, availability of data anybody can build a deep learning model that's not what differentiates you right what will make you a good data scientist if you understand what is happening under the hood what does a deep learning model do what are its limitation when is it good when is it not good right so so go deep is is the point i am trying to make this is one of the uh, a, a, a good take away in my opinion this will be the most important thing i can tell you right a good data scientist actually we have done a disservice by calling this role a data scientist right everybody says that i can just be a scientist no the, the people who built uh, rockets in isro were as good engineers as they were scientists and i think the same thing is happening here right if you want to be successful you need to be a good scientist and an engineer you need to have a lot of appreciation for software engineering and for software systems if you don't have that you will only go so far as to build prototypes build uh, uh, you know some jupiter notebooks but your your product will not get there into products or, or rather your algorithm your technique will not get there into products you will not be the one who is built that uh, next big thing that everybody is talking about right magic happens when scientists and engineers come together or ideally a person is good in both in science and engineering and and uh, can bridge that gap and and uh, figure out how to put that algorithm into production so what does it mean right what does it mean to be a good engineer you need to know your databases you need to know uh, how data is organized how uh, you can have a columnar uh, representation how it is laid out on disk what are the access patterns how does it uh, what are the different uh, 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 you know the your computer architecture right having data in disk versus in ram versus in l2 cache etc for the various sizes what are the uh, uh, latencies when the data is in different thing is important because the scale at which today we are uh, analyzing data right you you need to know these things uh, 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 you know you you can't just Uh, you need to know your data structures also for that matter right uh, when is a list good when is a stack uh, good uh, when is a tree good right you need to know these things you need to know about operating systems right uh, virtualization uh, new distributed operating systems like this kubernetes and all that right what do they do how are they fault tolerant right a lot of uh, 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 the the good solutions that are being built today in the public cloud are all distributed in nature right so how do you make this highly available how do you make this fault tolerant right including your machine learning models and so on you need to know right what are what are cpus good for what are gpus good for right you need to know all of these things so all of these courses that are being taught today are are very very important and you need to have a good solid uh, understanding of them like i said operating systems networking databases architecture uh, 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 you really need to understand them well this is something that i talked about earlier that know your uh, like kyc i would say kyd know your data structures and algorithms don't just use them uh, don't just it's not just enough to know their apis right uh, it's not just enough to know that you can do an insert versus pop versus in, in what is the cost of each of these operations right you need to know those details and and finally get your hands dirty right uh, participate in data challenges participate in hackathon do internships right um, i know it's asking a lot out of you right but but you are start, you are smart students who are hard working right so i don't think i'm saying anything that will come as a surprise for you but basically you to put it in short i'm saying look you know know your courses really well understand them all of them not just selective courses and put them uh, and and do your projects well right go beyond our projects and and do these hackathons and and do these data challenges and do internships right and uh, you know think about scale right don't just uh, i think it's a good first step to 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 use that kaggle data 
um, you know, whatever the data set is given to you and, and build a model on it. But then ask yourself, you know, instead of uh, 1 million data points, what if there were 1 billion data points? Will my algorithm still work? How can I make it more distributed? How can I parallelize it, right? At least start thinking about it. Uh, that is what is going to happen in industry when you go, or, or you can write papers about it, right? Even if you don't get a chance immediately in industry to, to work at that scale. And, uh, and this is my final piece of advice, right? Uh, after this, I'll open up for questions. See, I really feel that a lot of what is uh, exciting in the next five years, 10 years, will be at the intersection of domain, interdisciplinary research, right? So whether it is bioinformatics and data science, whether it is uh, energy and data science, whether it is uh, uh, climate prediction and data science, right? I think this is where the magic is happening. Uh, just yesterday, I was listening to a podcast uh, on Economist about what these guys are doing is they are using some, uh, I didn't fully understand it, right? but the bottom line was the following, right? They are using some laboratory processes to understand how the virus mutates, a virus like a, or a coronavirus, like a COVID virus. Then they are taking that mutated virus and then they are seeing how well that virus is in terms of transmissibility, in terms of um, you know, it's uh, it, it's harm to human beings and so on, right? So, and so what is, why are they doing this? And then all of this data is being used to develop a model saying that how will this virus mutate and which of those mutations will turn out to be a variance of concern. This is real uh, research that is happening in the US, right? So there is elements of machine learning there, which is, see, there is, First of all, there is interdisciplinary, right? You're understanding what does a virus do? How does it mutate? Somebody is then actually, there is a lab process which is simulating that and creating these variants of virus and coming up with some training data saying that, okay, these variants or mutations of the virus led, led to this strain which is powerful or whatever, right? And then the AI or ML part of it, the machine learning part is using this as a training data, predicting new variants uh, that will be of variants of concern. Because the goal of that research is to come up with a vaccine even before the, the variant hits us, like a Delta variant, right? So anyway, that is an example that I, I read about earlier, right? But that was from biosciences and, and machine learning, right? So a lot of this stuff will happen interdisciplinary. And in fact, that is one of the best parts about your institute. ISC has so many interdisciplinary courses, or you could reach across um, uh, departments uh, as part of your PhDs or your, or your M-Tech research. And, and do these things, right? So that's the last piece of advice I'll leave you with. And 